Good morning, everyone. Once again, as always, great to be with you. Thank you to those who have shown great concern of the fatal wound on my forehead. I had a fight with a chicken coop this week, and the chicken coop won. It had nothing to do with the actual chickens. It was the coop itself that attacked me. And uh, uh, the Lord was faithful. I survived and have lived to uh, breathe another day. So uh, probably not the last of many uh, wonderful farm tales. But this morning, we are privileged to be here for this Thanksgiving morning. And as we do so, um, truly giving thanks to the Lord. And as we'll read this morning, the Lord of the Harvest. Uh, and, and as we're going to take time to really contemplate and think about not only what has the Lord done, but what is he doing in the midst of our lives. Let's just pause for a word of prayer and we'll jump right into our scriptures this morning and look forward to hear from him. Let's pray. God, thank you again for uh, each member of this congregation that you've gathered here this morning. We thank you for those who cannot be here and perhaps are here in heart. I know our thoughts are with them. We pray that whether here or there, that again this morning you would both make yourself real to us. We thank you again that you are not a God of hide and seek, but one who desires to be seen, to be known. And we pray this morning that we would know you, that we would hear your voice, and that we would humble our hearts and be willing to listen. Thank you that as we open your word, again, we can trust that you alone are speaking and that these are not just words on the page, but words that reveal the character of the Holy One, the one to whom provides true life. And it is that life this morning that we want to celebrate and know and obtain amidst our daily lives. And so we thank you knowing that you are faithful to your word and that this morning uh, you will be faithful to each and every one of us. And for this, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, as we begin this morning, uh, for those who haven't been with us, perhaps, a note that we've been looking at, as one uh, passage puts it in the New Testament, at what it means to walk in a manner worthy of his calling. And as we've been looking at these words, we've been looking through a book called 1 Samuel. And in this book, we've been looking at people who've been living before God. And as God looks at them, there are things that he is looking for. Number one that we've looked at is faith. Hebrews 11, by faith men of old gained approval. And it went on to tell us that without faith, it is impossible to please him. That is not just to know his name, perhaps call his name, but to actively depend on his name, to rest in his arms, his strength, to trust him. This is what he desires. And as we read on, we looked that not only does God want faith, but he wants a faith that leads us to obedience, that we would not only believe in him, but that we would rest in him and trust him enough that when he says, go, we would go, that when he says, speak, we would speak, that when God says, give, you would give, and that when he says, forgive, you would forgive. That is, not only does he want faith, trust, he wants a faith that leads you to obedience. And not only that, but he wants, uh, as we look at the third point, uh, that he wants a heart of humility. And for those who were here uh, last Sunday, we looked at the fact that humility, true humility, is not thinking less of yourself, but actually thinking of yourself less. Right? Not not thinking less of yourself, that you are unworthy, that you are lesser than, no, but actually noting that you are God's child when you've accepted him, that you are a wonderful creation, fearfully made, and yet in that same moment, thinking about yourself less, thinking about God's vision, God's purpose, God's story that he wants to reveal in the midst of your life and those around you. And, and as we've been looking at these things, uh, we've been looking at what it means to walk in a manner worthy of his call. And, and there's, a, there's a point in place in 1 Samuel that I want to touch on this morning that is going to remind us that even though we know these things, that God desires faith, obedience, humility, that, that today you can know it, but you can settle for less. You can know all these things. You can know his name. 
and yet you can settle for less. And this morning, as we celebrate the harvest, uh, I was laughing to myself. We have a couple uh, working on our farm once again, this time not German after a run of about 15 Germans in a row. Uh, and we were nearly all wearing lederhosen and, uh, and, and drinking beer, but we stopped short. And now we have a couple from France that have joined us. And they speak very poor English. And I found myself having to describe, they asked the question, uh, what is this uh, Thanksgiving, right? They did not know. And, and in their broken English, they asked. And I had to uh, look back at my days in Quebec to try and describe Thanksgiving, a celebration of the harvest. Well, in, in Quebec, uh, there was Thanksgiving, but to, to kind of depict the, the fullness of it, we had another celebration that in Quebec was even bigger. Do you know what this, this was? The maple syrup season, okay? Huge. In fact, uh, there they call it the cabana souk. What's a cabana souk? It's a sugar cabin. And there are these massive halls, and they are only open a few weeks out of the year. And they are there specifically to celebrate maple syrup, of all things. If you're not sure how important maple syrup is to the Quebecer, listen, you've heard in the U.S. how they have the, the government oil reserves and the price fluctuates based on the amount of reserved oil. In Quebec, they have maple syrup reserves. And in the same way, the economy fluctuates based on how much is held in the tank that year. And so the sugaring off season, as we called it in English, was when spring came and the maple syrup would flow. And it was a tradition from way back when, and there were many things. The people from the city would come out to the countryside and the farmers and all of them would gather together in huge celebrations. And there were set things. When you would go to a cabana souk, you would go and there would be a five course meal in front of you. Because traditionally, the people from the city would bring out things like a split pea soup. The people from the city would bring out crepes that they would make homemade and bring them forward. Uh, the people in the farm would bring eggs and bacon and sausages. And, and, and uh, picture this, you'd pour maple syrup on all of it, including the soup, okay? And then when that was done, then out would come another thing. Uh, you'd have the crepes for dessert. And when that was done, there was something called tarte souk, basically sugar pie. Picture your pumpkin pie only filled with maple syrup boiled down to a taffy that filled your pie crust. Like, I, I took friends there that were left spinning and unable to walk afterwards. And if you thought we were done there, think twice because uh, then you'd stop with what we called tear sur la neige. This is when you boil the maple syrup down to a taffy, pour it on the snow, stick a stick in it, wind it up, and suck on it. There were a few times when I was the one advocating for free insulin shots with every meal because it was unbelievable. And yet, an incredible celebration that brought everyone together to celebrate the harvest. The harvest of the syrup. The harvest of what had been provided that year. Now, when we look at this, we're here this morning, we're celebrating, we're giving thanks in much that same way. And yet this morning, I've got to uh, be honest with you that not only do we give thanks for the provision of God in what he's provided, and throughout scripture we read about a God of the harvest, a God of provision. But it's at these times when you begin to bring in the harvest, as we are on the farm, that you actually have to stop and look and see what's coming in. And last year, we had a bumper crop of some things. We had squash. We had zucchini as big as footballs. We were trying to give them away because we did not know what to do with them all. This year, though last year, a bumper crop of beans, we went out to check them, and all we had were these like little shrivelly pods left on the vine that were absolutely nothing. And when we went out to celebrate the harvest, we were left thinking, what did we do wrong this time? Has anyone been there? Where you go out, and though you expect a great harvest, Nothing. And perhaps the rats ate it first before you got it. The birds, the raccoons, the rabbits. 
but today the deer, right? Uh, you see, sometimes it's at these moments where we begin to look at our lives and not only celebrate what has been produced, but also have a moment to check the reality of what's being produced. And this morning, uh, this is my hope, not only as the Lord's been teaching me this week, but also for you, that, that today we wouldn't settle for less. And I hope you understand as I read what I mean by that. We're going to look at 1 Samuel in chapter 8 this morning. And I'm going to read a few verses for you so that you, uh, again, as we've already talked about it, but look a little more at the detail of what was going on at that time. 1 Samuel chapter 8 is in the midst of a people led by God, but this is what happens. And some of these verses will be familiar, but we will read forward and onward so that we gain our context this morning and see what God has for us. It says this, chapter 8, verse 1, 1 Samuel. It came about when Samuel was old that he appointed his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second Abijah, and they were judging in Beersheba. His sons, however, did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes, perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah, and they said to him, Behold, you have grown old in your son, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Appoint a king for us to judge us like all the nations." But the thing was displeasing in the sight of Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. The Lord said, Samuel, listen to the voice of the people in regard to all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Like all the deeds which they have done since the day that I brought them up from Egypt, even to this day. In that they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing to you also. Now then, listen to their voice. However, you shall solemnly warn them and tell them of the procedure of the king who will reign over them. And so here we see again the demand of the people for a king. He goes on and says this, Samuel spoke the words of the Lord to the people who asked them a, a, a king. He said, this will be the procedure of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons, place them for himself in his chariots among his horsemen, and they will run before his chariots. He will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and of fifties, some to do this plowing and reap his harvest and to make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters for perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and your vineyards and your olive groves and give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. He will also take your male servants and your female servants and your best young men and your donkeys and use them for his work. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his servants. See, I want to stop there because in this moment, I want you to note that God had promised an incredible harvest for the people. It's back in Leviticus that we are told and reminded uh, of this as he tells them the good laws of the good and great God to keep his Sabbath rest. To, to revere his sanctuary, for he is the Lord. It says this in verse 3 of Leviticus 26. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments so as to carry them out, then I shall give you rains in their season so that the land will yield its produce and the trees of the field will bear their fruit. Indeed, your threshing will last for you until grape gathering and grape gathering will last until sowing time. You will thus eat your food to the full and live securely in your land. You, I shall grant peace in the land so that you may lie down with no one making you tremble. I shall also eliminate harmful beasts from the land, and no sword will pass through your land. But you will chase your enemies, and they will fall before you by the sword. Five of you will chase a hundred, and a hundred of you will chase ten thousand, and your enemies will fall before you by the sword. Isn't that great? God had promised this incredible harvest. They could enjoy the land. They could enjoy the fruit. They could enjoy the harvest of their labor. 
promised. These were the things to come when God was their king. But did you notice, as we read Samuel, it says they settled. We want to be like everyone else. See, this is where I fail to see, and I'm realizing to the full today. Harvest takes work. Did you notice that God did not say, and the grapes will fall into your mouth, and the wheat will blow into your barn? Did he say that? I wish, and sometimes I pray it. But no, the fruit would be there. God would provide it. But yet it was their work to maintain, to keep, to plow, to water, to grow, to harvest, to prune. That here, they were going to live in an abundant land, and by the work of their hand, God would bless them. And yet, now, and here's the reality, everyone, faith takes work. To trust in this invisible God that says, I've got you, that's tough. Not easy. It's far easier to rest on what you can see. To lean on what's tangible. A friend, a family member, a bank account, a dollar value, a stock, a bond. They're physical, but not secure. You see, it takes work to cultivate faith in which you must relentlessly trust this God who says, I've got you. But you see, I don't want to put in the work of the harvest. I'd rather settle for less. And isn't that it? There are times when we, and I've told you before, we'll have all this food around us, and we are producing this organic, non-GMO, free-range, incredible meat on our farm. And, and when we do, we'll come, and after producing all this meat, we'll say, what's for dinner? I don't feel like cooking, do you? Do we have a frozen pizza in the oven? <laughs> Can we just toss one in? Who feels like cooking it? Who feels like going to the work of preparing a, a big meal? Right? It takes work. It takes work to eat this not just satisfying meal, but fulfilling and healthy meal. And sometimes we're too lazy to take it. And I'm embarrassed to say how often, and here's our kids living on this farm. We eat amazingly, and yet our kids' favorite meal, what would you like for supper? Smoothie and popcorn, please. Okay, <laughs> great. Right, less work for us. But you see, the people settled. When they could have enjoyed the fullness of the harvest, God is their king. They said, no, we want our own king, like all the other nations. And he said, warning. He's going to take a tenth of all you have. He's going to take your best land. And so now, instead of enjoying the fullness of the harvest, what am I doing? Enjoying the sides. Enjoying second best. And I'll tell you what, today, just like me going out and looking at our shrivelly beans, okay, I have to stop and say, did I not water them enough? <laughs> Was I lazy? <laughs> Didn't I fix that leak in the irrigation system? What went wrong? You see, because often, it wasn't the ground's fault. It wasn't the vine's fault. It's something I did, because though the harvest was there, uh, I wasn't prepared. I settled for something less. And here's the thing, as we give thanks this week, I hope we can give thanks for the blessings of the Lord. Here, we're all here fed today, aren't we? And some more, some less. We all have clothes on today. <laughs> Perhaps some nicer than others. You be the judge. I don't know. But some from the thrift store. Some from the store. Whatever. God's provided in a variety of ways for a variety of people in a variety of circumstances. We've got lots to be thankful for. And yet today I'm left with a question. How often do I settle? And here's what happens. We look at not just physical fruit. How often am I willing to do, as we live in a culture, work for the harvest of true relationship and intimacy? 
That takes work. Or, or do I settle uh, for, for the cheap thrills of uh, pornography and, and escapism in media? Right? Easy to escape. Hard work to harvest true relationship and intimacy. Am I willing to put the work in? God's providing it, but am I taking it? A a am I willing to do the hard work of the harvest and bring in the fruit of patience? Or, or have I settled for second best and settled for impatience and anger? Right? Uh, have, am I willing to do the, the, the hard work and the harvest of forgiveness, which leads to peace? Or am I settling for the easy road, and that is settling for anger, grudge, unforgiveness? Am I willing to do the hard work to learn the fruit of peace? Or am I settling for, for a world of anxiety and worry? God has offered an abundant harvest today, hasn't he? What does it tell us? The fruit of the Spirit is peace, patience, kindness, self-control, love. All these things are available in the harvest of God when he is king of our lives, when he is Lord of our actions. And yet it's not just that it falls on our laps, isn't it? This season, we had to pick the grapes off the vine. We had to rush and pull down the pears before the storm came and the wind blew them down. We had to prune the trees, pick the apples, feed the hogs, or there be no bacon, and this would be a very sad thing. You see, in order to reap the harvest, there was work to be done. But so often, I settle for second best, and I don't reap the full harvest. Why? Because I stop short of making him king of my life, the lord of my actions, nor am I willing to be humble enough to offer him up in humility my life and livelihood. See, it's interesting as we read the scriptures, God says this in Matthew and chapter 9. Seeing the people, he said this, verse 36, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. See, it was, he saw their circumstances. The fruit was at hand, but he said, pray for the workers. I love Paul, and I believe I've read these to you before, but again, never ashamed to read them again and again when it is time for a good reminder. And that is this, that when Paul writes, he writes to tell a people that he has not simply been there for them in the midst of good circumstances, easy times, but in the midst of the hard times, even more so. And it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 that Paul reminds us, and I remind you today, that he gives us a list of several things. First, several things in the midst of the circumstances that he's found himself in. He says this, Behold, now is the acceptable time. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse uh, 2. He says, Now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation giving no cause for offense in anything so that the mis ministry will not be discredited, but in everything commending ourselves as servants of God in much endurance, in afflictions, in hardships, in distresses, in beatings, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labor, in sleeplessness, and in hunger. This is Paul's ministry. 
In the midst of all these things, he served. And yet I want you to notice, he doesn't just tell them uh, about the things that he has suffered, though suffered he had. He goes on in his list and he reminds them of, and in same fashion, a number of things that he's experienced and harvested in the midst of the difficulties. Listen to this. Beatings, imprisonments, sleeplessness, hunger. Listen to this. Verse 6, chapter 6, 2 Corinthians. In purity, in knowledge, in patience, in kindness, in the Holy Spirit, in genuine love, in the word of truth, in the power of God, by the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the left. Isn't that great? Though things all around him seem poor, he had been harvesting the richness and the gifts of a great God. See, today, as we give thanks to the God of all harvest, we want to give thanks not only for the things we have, and often these times bring us to the physical, the tangible that surround us, but even more so today, I hope we could come to a place where we can give thanks for the spiritual gift of this great God. That is in the midst of poverty, hunger, sleeplessness, turmoil, tumults. That he is a God who can be providing and harvesting the fruit of purity and knowledge and patience and kindness and forgiveness and genuine love. These times are a time to look at what the barn holds. This year, we forgot to order enough hay, <laughs> and we're running around looking for more. And we're left with that question is, what has the Lord harvested this year? Because if I've planted a garden, and I come back, and all I see are weeds, I need to ask, who is the great gardener? <laughs> Have I let God do the pruning this year? Have I let God do the watering this year? Have I let God do the great harvesting this year? Because there are times and seasons where I settle for less. I settle for a marriage that has more discontentment than contentment. Again, instead of doing the hard work of relationship, forgiveness, intimacy. I settle for kids that, that are, feel free to run about and do about all they want instead of doing the hard work of discipline, correction, love, and care. I, I settle for the weeds and the things in my life that surround me instead of doing the work of the harvest that God desires. And I hope this morning that not only can we praise him, and perhaps this is a great time to stop and think, what has God done this year? And I can look back, not at the, just the good things that my mind loves to go to, but the hard things. Because today I can tell you, in my barn, there's been a great harvest of patience. I don't like how it came about. <laughs> but the crop has been full this year, and I've learned it. There's been a great harvest of peace. Why? Not because there's been great war, but because there's been inner turmoil. <laughs> Watching finances and bank accounts and dollars go up and down and more down than up. <laughs> In which I can say, thank you, Lord, as you brought me to a place where I can rest on you and experience peace that passes all understanding. Because I shouldn't feel very peaceful right now. Right? It's been a great harvest of peace. We've come to a time where today I can say thank you for your provision in so many ways. And yet I can see a few crops that I forgot to go out and harvest in due time that got rained on. <laughs> There's a crop of forgiveness 
that I didn't go and get, and partly because I settled for less and didn't want to forgive. There's a crop of patience out there that I left on the field. Why? Because I didn't do the work, and, and, and I, I embraced impatience rather than collect, get, and do the work of the harvest of patience. See, today we can always settle for a lesser king, settle for second best, give our best to the wind or to the earthly king or the earthly thing that holds our attention and our utmost. When today, when we can put the Lord of the harvest at the center of our hearts and lives, then all will begin to be full and right and fulfilling if we would allow it. Perhaps today, not only will God put his finger on your heart and share with you some of those areas which you can give thanks, even the areas through hardship today, where he has taught you, brought you, molded you, and shaped you into his likeness. And today, though the process was not fun, you can say, thank you. As you find yourself a little more in his likeness today. As we thank him for the physical, so too the spiritual. But today, perhaps, he will also, as we sit around the table, put his finger on our hearts in those areas where we've left the harvest on the field. And God is saying, it still remains in my strength. Go and get it. Because I want to bring healing where there is brokenness. I want to bring strength where there is weakness. I want to bring forgiveness where there is no seeing eye to eye. I want to see love where there is hate. And in me and only in me will you begin to see this fruit of righteousness come to pass. Today, let's honor the God of the harvest. And as I love to read, when you go back all the way to Genesis in chapter 8, and God promised that there would never be a flood again, do you know what he said? As long as the earth shall remain... And I shall read it, for I shall quote it improperly. While earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. See, the harvest is never over in God. Even when it seems like there is no hope, it is too late. Perhaps it rained too hard. God is the God who can grow trees out of rocks, make fountains out of rocks, and bring fruit in the midst of a desert where it seemed there could be no fruit. But first we must make him our king, put him in the right place, and there and then we will truly know and then begin to give thanks to the God of all harvest, both that which we see and that which we know in the depths of our hearts. And we will see the working out of as we allow him to. So as we go out these doors this week and as we enjoy this Thanksgiving season, let us remember to live by faith in trust, obediently as we follow him, that we might walk humbly, again, not thinking less of ourselves, but thinking of ourselves less, but also walking out looking to the God of all harvest, that he might grow within us the fruit of all righteousness and bear the fruit that we cannot without him. Let's pray. God, thank you that this morning that we can come together and know that where there is division, you can mend. That where there is brokenness, where there is brokenness, you can you can fill. Where there is a divide, you can overcome. Where we have sinned and erred, you can bring back. Where we have been impatient, you can instill patience. Where we have held grudges, you can plant forgiveness. I pray that we would not settle for the easy things of this world the tangible, that we can see, feel, but that we would long for, cling to, and hold on, and wait for the things of righteousness. Knowing that you begin a work that you will be faithful to complete until the day of the Lord. Thank you for this. 
And I pray today that in this season, we will begin to see and give thanks for more than the things we see, but the things we know to be true. That is your work within our lives and the lives of those around us. For this, we give thanks in all things. In Jesus' name, amen.